Good morning, happy Sunday. This spinning blue green ball, yes, Gaia, mother of everything, we walk gently across your back to come together again in this place to remember how we can live, to remember who we are, to create how we will be, Gaia, our home, the lap in which we live, welcome us. As is our custom, if you'd like to come and light a candle for joy, for a concern, or just to bring more light into the world, please do so while we sit in stillness listening to the prelude. spirit for our chalice lighting and spoken affirmation. Our Mother, who is in heaven and within us, we call upon your many names. Your wisdom come, your will be done in all the spaces in which you dwell. Give us each day sustenance and perseverance. Remind us of our limits as we give grace to the limits of others. Separate us from the temptation of empire, but deliver us into community. For you are the dwelling place within us, the empowerment among us, and the celebration around us now and forever. Amen. Join me as we remind ourselves 
of the affirmation that is a cornerstone of our free faith tradition. The words, should you need them, are in the morning program. Love is the spirit of this church. Service is its law. This is its great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and freedom, and to help one another. The opening thought today is from The Spiral Dance by Starhawk. I first read this book in the early 80s, and I've probably read it a couple of times since then, but I did not remember this epilogue at all. But when I checked through my copy last night to, for any last-minute kernels of wisdom, it was eerily apt for today's reading. A friend recently had a dream in which a powerful woman figure appeared to her and said, when a witch, I'm sorry, when a, I'm sorry, at least I remembered to light the candle this time. Um, a friend recently had a dream in which a powerful woman figure appeared to her and said, when a witch acquires the acrostic eye, she changes. We both thought a lot about the meaning of the acrostic eye. An acrostic, of course, is a form of crossword puzzle in which everything has many meanings. Looked at it as we normally do horizontally, the letters form certain words. But if we shift our vision to right angles, it all changes. The essence of witchcraft and of political feminism is acrostic vision. We look at our culture and our conditioning from another angle and read an entirely different message. Acrostic vision is uncomfortable. It sets us at odds with everything we've been taught. We are forced to validate our own experience since no external authority will do that for us. In thinking about the future of religion and of culture, we need to look at the present through the acrostic eye. That slightly skewed vision reveals those underlying mindsets. I think of as scabies of unconsciousness because they cause us extreme discomfort, and yet we can't ordinarily see them. They're embedded in us under the skin. We must examine the destructive forces as well as the creative forces that are influencing the direction of our evolution as a society. Only when we understand the currents of the present can we clearly envision the future. If we accept the responsibility of claiming the future for life, then we must engage in the demanding task of recreating culture. A deep and profound change is needed in our attitude toward the world and the life on it, toward each other, and in our conceptions of what is human. Somehow, we must win clear of the roles we've been taught, of strictures on the mind and self that are learned before speech and are buried so deep they cannot be seen. Today, we are creating new myths and singing a new liturgy. Ancient mother, I hear you calling. Ancient mother, I hear your song. Ancient mother, Ancient Mother, I hear you calling. Ancient Mother, I hear your song. Ancient Mother, I feel your laughter. Ancient Mother, I taste your tears. 
From Aaron Carter, who is the co founder and co director of Frailty Myths, a nonprofit that offers empowerment, workshops for women in woodworking, strength training, sailing, and more. We are combining the usual two readings into one this morning. Quote, five lessons for imagining the future. One, imagine big. Anything is possible. One of the greatest tricks that capitalism plays is convincing all of us that an old dog can't learn new tricks. Not only is that not true for older dogs, but it certainly isn't true about modern society. For many of my fellow millennials, ugh, the stark truth is that this ethos that says change is impossible and naive has become ubiquitous in how my generation sees the world. But change is all around us, and it happens quickly. We've lived through so many things that were considered impossible just a few years ago. Quote, there are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks where decades happen, end quote. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Remind yourself to imagine big. Nothing is off limits and nothing is unchangeable. The first rule of imagination is that anything is possible. We must give ourselves the space to dream without limitations or boundaries. People often say that change doesn't happen overnight, but change can happen in a moment, over a year, or it can take a lifetime. Strive for change and transformation and don't limit yourself to how long that transformation might take. Two, imagine with others. Embrace the power of community. There is a great African proverb that's used by everyone from Instagram meme accounts to Al Gore to the Wikipedia quote of the day. Quote, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go together. Close quote. The principle behind this saying is clear. We are, by our very nature, communal creatures. As humans, most of our daily behavior is motivated by building connections, whether through friendship, partnership, marriage, family, or by building community, cities, and countries. Humanity is driven by relationships. So it makes sense that not only are we driven to connect with each other, but historically we have also built incredible things when we have worked together, the Tower of Babel notwithstanding. If two minds are better than one, imagine what a bunch of minds can do. Imagine with your friends and family and community. Build spaces where you can learn about new ideas and new perspectives. Creating an imagination community is a powerful tool in building a brand new world. Three, imagine with love. Be tender with new ideas and spaces. Imagining new ideas is just like learning how to dance. For some of us, imagining can feel awkward and a little offbeat. New ideas can be incomplete and fluid. Saying ideas out loud requires more than intelligence and a willingness to speak up. It requires a lot of bravery. Imagining is a vulnerable act. Brene Brown, one of my favorite authors on the power of self-love and connection, describes just how powerful being vulnerable can feel. 
open quote, vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage, close quote. Build an imagination space where everyone has the space to be fearless. Inspire each other to be tender and loving with new ideas and new connections. If we imagine with love, we can build a community where people speak with the truth and courage to explore new possibilities. Next, imagine a lot. Practice makes perfect. My grandma was from the south of the United States, so we grew up with platitudes and moral lessons to go with everything. When I was a young kid, she used to always tell me, you'll get good at anything you practice at. Repeat an action over and over and you'll get better, whether the action is positive or negative. Practice being late all the time. Very quickly, you'll find yourself an expert on how to be late. Practice learning a new instrument. Get ready to impress your next door neighbors with horrible renditions of when the saints go marching in for the next six months. Create a space to practice where being perfect isn't the goal. It's okay to sound horrible. It's okay to miss a note. And it's okay if your theory for changing the world tomorrow isn't perfect either. And anything that we do over and over, whether it's a good habit or a bad habit, will become just that, a habit. Practice imagining. It comes in so many different ways. Imagine a new world. Draw a house you've always wanted to live in. Write down what your perfect job would look like. We can imagine through song, through dance, through just saying words out loud. The goal isn't to just get it right the first time. Instead, build consistency and allow space for your mind to wander. Imagine with intent. The future is up for grabs. It's so scary to be the first one, whether it's the first to try something new, the first to say something isn't quite right, or the first to go off into a different direction. In any case, it often feels like not only can we not make change, but that it's foolish for us to even try. And it's true. Changing the world takes courage. But here's the incredible thing about courage. Courage is contagious. There's nothing scarier than raising your hand in a room full of people and saying, I don't understand. And almost always when someone does that, the murmur of agreement flows across the room. Always remember that if you're confused, someone else probably is too. More importantly, if you have the courage to say that you are confused, you'll notice that others will too, because courage is contagious. The future isn't set in stone. It isn't decided. If you have the courage to speak out and speak up, then use it. Remember that the words you speak have power. It's hard to write about such optimism in the face of what feels like a daily onslaught of attacks against our humanity and right to exist. Some days, it's hard to imagine that there is the possibility of a future that isn't as dim as the reality we see in front of us every day. And yet, even in these times, there are small bright spots, small moments that make you laugh or bring you joy, even if for a second. And if that's possible, it's possible to have moments of joy in what has felt like a season of sadness. Then anything is possible. The one thing I know for sure is that our dream of creating a world different from the one we live in, where our humanity is a given and our future is unimaginable, is possible. And it's a future worth fighting for. Our practice this morning begins with this brief excerpt from the poem, You Reading This, Be Ready, by William Stafford, followed by a moment of silence. <clears throat> Will you ever bring a better gift for 
the world than the breathing respect that you carry. Wherever you go right now, are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? When you turn around starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found carry <clears throat> into evening. All that you want from this day, this interval you spent, reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now? <clears throat> Starting here, right in this room, when you turn around. Every time I thought I had this discourse nailed down, I would find a new fact that changed everything. And I would rework it, and then I'd find a new fact. And so once again, that space-time reality thing has just really been a bummer and hard to work around. Climate change is a reality, isn't it? Things really are going to get bad, aren't they? It's going to profoundly change the world, isn't it? Am I safe in saying that many of us have thought, at least I won't be alive to see it? How do you see the future of this city, of Dallas, of the states of Texas and Oklahoma, dystopian hellscapes, or pockets of Eden itself? We thought climate change would happen someday. We keep getting urgent messages that something must be done. But we didn't know that summer heat has been trending upwards since the 1940s. This June was the hottest month on record. Then July was. August looks likely to set the next record. We're smart people, educated people. When we see that the record keeping only goes back to 1850, we know that that is just a blink of the eye in geological terms. Sadly, geologists and paleontologists agree that this summer is likely the hottest in 120,000 years. And at its worst, could become the hottest era in 25 million years, back when the poles were tropical. An internet meme points out that while these temperatures are the hottest it has ever been, they are also the coolest it will ever be, at least in a time frame we can fathom. Frightening, isn't it? The ocean near Miami reached 100 degrees this summer, nearly 20 degrees above normal. While TV weather people were bemoaning the inability to go to a swim to cool off, biologists and oceanographers are fearing major coral bleaching, indicating deaths. This heat wave is expected to reach 50% of the world's seas, causing deaths and changed migration patterns of the sea life there. The hot water invites the spread of red tide, a toxic algae bloom, and it feeds into storm systems, giving them far more power than cooler water would. Drought is so severe that ancient inundated cities are appearing, likely for the first time in thousands of years. A mummified baby mammoth was found in the Yukon and thought to be 30,000 years old. 
The melting permafrost in Russia has produced a plethora of woolly mammoths and led researchers to posit that as icebergs melted, as seas rose, as grasslands became And I'm missing a page. As grasslands became lakes and marshes, they had nothing to eat. The good news there is that not only did life survive this ice age, but human life did too. Okay, that's, oh. An article I read when I was working on this began with a, the perky naivete of the totally clueless. Let's imagine for a moment that we have traveled forward in time to the year 2050. What does the place you live now look like? Sound like? Smell like? How does it feel to be there? I see urban streets planted with herbs and plants, the hum of bees, the sparkle of collectively owned solar panels, and affordable homes retrofitted for energy conservation. I imagine a care-centered city with well-funded and reliable public services where the, your, the quality of your life is not determined by how much money you have, where everyone gets to feel joy and where all services and utilities from water to mobility are designed not to be destructive to our environment, but to support its regeneration. <clears throat> I was so depressed by what I'd been reading that I forgot that that was pretty much the point of my discourse. I thought, oh, sweet child of summer, let me tell you, I don't need to go 30 years into the future because I can remember 30 years in the past. I can even remember some of 30 years before that. And the way things looked and smelled and sounded then were pretty much how they are now. There were more businesses downtown 60 years ago before the freeway lured them away in the hedonistic rush to suburban sprawl. As the finance people like to smirk when saying, the best predictor of future performance is past performance. Most places had better public transit back then, before everybody had a car. Of course, the reason everybody has a car now is because there's no reliable and timely public transit. Cities were lured by developers to put more and more money into streets and roads, and developers bought more and more pasture land, creating new neighborhoods that relied on cars, all of it putting more strain on public transit while slashing its budget. As we apparently now need to have a Lowe's, Home Depot, Target, Walmart, Petco, PetSmart, and all the supporting store services and restaurants approximately every seven miles. And because housing develops magically appear around the new strip malls, more and more farmland is taken out of production, leaving the questions of where did all these people come from? And what are they going to eat when they cover the last acre of farmland with a Hobby Lobby? But 60 years ago, Blacks and their allies were fighting for fair voting rights. 60 years ago, even 30 years ago, most people, including people of color, could not conceive of the idea there would be a black president. 60 years ago, there was no Loving v. Virginia decision or Roe v. Wade. 60 years ago, we had no EPA and the rivers burned. Back in the 80s, I was discovering the women's spirituality movement and discussed with municipal zoning and distrust of city government. It wasn't enough to go back to the land, and besides, Vermont probably already has its limit of hippie farmers. I found a book called Eco City Berkeley that profoundly changed my view of the world. 
The author, the author Richard Register, chose Berkeley as a model for developing plans to remake the city and its society because it has access to the bay, a river, farmland, and a forward-thinking populace. Not forward-thinking enough because most of this has never come to pass. The first evil that must be addressed is automotive sprawl. Get rid of cars in the center city by taking away the need for them. Register imagined that electric vehicles and driverless buses could get people around, and that is finally panning out. Building up the density of the central city by erecting beautiful multi-use buildings with stores on the ground floor, offices on the second and maybe higher floors, and the rest of the building residential. Soundproof all units, add balconies, rooftop gardens and greenhouses, pools, and other amenities to make living there desirable. That doesn't sound much different from Manhattan or Boston. Being in the city means you're within walking, biking, or bus distance of restaurants, clubs, parks, theaters, and jobs. Streets don't need to be so wide when there are so few cars, so they can be repurposed with container gardens that bring beauty and, yes, herbs and bees to the areas, connecting them with nature. Parking lots can be repurposed. As cities nearly wrecked by Euclidean single-use zoning pull their populations inward, Formerly occupied land on the outskirts can be converted to intensive farming and serve much of the city's food. In Berkeley, the river that runs under the city could be opened up and salmon ladders erected to bring the salmon back. Wunerf is the Dutch word for a street that has essentially become a place instead of a route. In hundreds of Dutch and German cities, Selected residential and mixed-use streets have been designated as Wunderfin with significant street redu speed reductions and turned into places where cars may enter and park, but where the feeling is more of a park than a street, with benches, trees, playground equipment, gardens, and statues. Nearby cafes and electric train platforms would complete these neighborhood centers. Arcades, awnings, and covered walkways would make them pleasantly accessible in wet or snowy weather. But what about reimagining what is? Well, building, rebuilding cities is a pretty good example. Turning streets into gardens and turning suburbs back into productive and healthy farmland is also a nice trick. Notice that we already have everything we need to make these things happen. We don't need to wait until science develops a super uber cure for every ill and inconvenience that always creates more problems. But listen to Starhawk's vision of what San Francisco could be. You're walking the dogs up on the hill they call La Matria the mother's womb. Below is spread a sparkling panorama of the city, a living tapestry of rainbow colors on a warp of green. All during sun return moon, fireworks lit the night sky, celebrating La Purissima, the festival of the conception of the Virgin. The streets were filled with processions, the Catholics and pagans dancing together without arguing about which virgin they were celebrating. And everybody else in the city, it seemed, joining in for the fun of it. Three cows graze along the top of the hill. Their young minder sprawled on her back, enjoying the sun. The cows are the project of the kids at your child's school. The neighborhood market collective buys the milk and cream. And with the profits and their own labor, they are constructing what surely must be the world's most elaborate skate park. To the east, you can see the bay. The pelicans and gulls swoop and cry across the fishing fleet. And the huge sails of the great ocean-going trade ships spread like wings. There's plenty of wind. They won't be needing to use their solar batteries today. 
You call the dogs and head back down the processional way, reveling in the scent of apple tr of the blossoms of apple trees lining the walkway. The trees are old now. Fruit trees were planted along walkways during the hungry times when so many people did not have enough to eat. They are still cherished and their fruit is still welcome. Now sidewalk cafes line the streets where parents can enjoy a cup of coffee with friends while keeping an eye on their children on the playground. Now your street narrows. A large greenhouse structure lines of the roadbed where trolley cars and electric vehicles run along the one-way street. The greenhouse is the neighborhood waste treatment plant where banked rows of water hyacinth are aquacultured to purify waste and create clean water and compost. You open the door to your collective house and one of your housemates calls out, the ship is in, the chocolate consortium called, they want everybody who can to come down there and unload. The ship is in from Central America, one of the great winged traders carrying your long awaited shipment of cocoa beans and cane sugar. You greet your coworkers from the Truffle Collective and say hello to your friends from other collectives in the consortium, the bakers, the candy makers, the chocolate chip collective, and a representative from the ice cream collective. Together, you unload the heavy sacks, count the inventory, and examine their other wares, the intricately woven hammocks, and the innovations in intelligent crystal technology. The ship will return laden with Sonoma wines, precision tools from the East Bay foundries, artichokes from Santa Cruz, and a load of state-of-the-art skateboards. Finally, the whole shipment is packed away in electro trucks to take it back to the factories. It's been a day of hard work, but a nice change from being in the candy kitchen or in front of a computer. The captain invites you and your friends up to her cabin for a cold drink. After you ritually exchange compliments and computer software, you invite her and her compañeros to spend the evening with you. The moon will be full tonight. Your ritual circle will meet up on the hill and guests will be welcome. You will dance to the moon and then head downtown for it is Chinese New Year and the dragon will dance through the streets. There will be fireworks, parades, and celebrations. You bicycle home. In the last hour of daylight, you have time to pull a few weeds and turn the compost pile. Like most of the city's living groups, your household grows much of its own food, providing all of its salad greens, most vegetables, and many fruits, nuts, and herbs. One of your housemates feeds the chickens and the goat. You can shower, soak your sore muscles in the hot tub, chat with your child, and relax before dressing for the celebration. It's been a long day, but a good one. Now for some really good food and to dance all night in friendly streets aglow with moonlight. Beautiful, isn't it? And except for the intelligent crystals, completely doable right now. If only we had the people's will to create and explore and coexist. So I had this all figured out in a nice little framework. And then I started reading how parts of the world will be too hot for people to be outside for more than a few hours. Those places won't be having pretty gardens and quiet neighborhood centers under the trees. They pretty much have to live underground. How would that be feasible? How much would it cost to dig deep terraced holes in the ground? But we already have those too. We have thousands and thousands of miles of mines. Many of them could be reinforced structurally to support housing. And cousins of the solar tubes we use to bring light to dark areas in our homes could be used to bring sunlight for plants and people deep underground. Careful social design could make them both beautiful and useful, a delight rather than a grim necessity. Again, we already have the technology for this. As a native Texan, I grew up going to Galveston and learning about the great hurricane 
and its aftermath. To prevent future flooding, the city jacked up downtown and low-lying residential neighborhoods several feet into the air and filled in with mud and sand to raise the city above the flood lines of the hurricane. Even today, when you notice the cast iron fences with odd proportions, it's because you're only seeing the top of the fence. The rest of it's buried. We did that in 1901 without today's heavy equipment. In proof of synchronicity, with a snarky edge to it, yesterday afternoon I received an email showing some of the strangest places people live. It came in too late to be added to the slides for today. But many of the strange places were built in natural or created caves in rocky hills with front facades made to look like other houses in the villages. Most of these were in Eastern Europe, but it's easy to see we not only have the technology to build these today, we had it hundreds of years ago. We have the technology, the know-how, the building materials to reshape our planet for survival of not only climate change, but also of the mass deprecations we have inflicted on it. Look with the acrostic eye and see a vibrant and healthy future. Look with the acrostic eye and search for ways to develop the will of the people to create it. This morning, our reading for the give, for giving is by Brandock L. Lovely. Let there be an offering to sustain and strengthen this place, which is sacred to so many of us, a community of memory and of hope, for we are now the keepers of the dream. The bowl is waiting, and you may also donate online. When the world goes mad, be wildly kind. To everyone, everyone, everyone. You can't control much, but you control how you treat others. This is what I teach the pre-Ks. In these breaking news, heartbreaking times when nothing feels certain, let your raw kindness and be a certainty. Allow your compassion to become a north star stamped up in the sky for others to follow back home. Please join me in saying the words to extinguish our chalice. The words are in the morning program and on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Go in peace, go lifted. Oh